Learn how to increase your sales and profits on Amazon and how to build your business to eventually exit for the highest multiple as I chat with our guest that has done this growth to exit process dozens of times. Are you looking for new ways to make your sales grow? You've tried other podcasts, but they don't seem to know. Harvest the growth potential of your product or service as we share stories and strategies that will make your competitors nervous. Now, here's the host of the Harvest Growth Podcast, John LeClaire. Welcome back to the show. I'm really excited to have Neil Twa on our show today. Neil is the CEO and co-founder of Voltage Holdings and co-author of the book, Almost Automated Income with FBA. Mr. Twa is a force to be reckoned with, really, in the world of e-commerce and entrepreneurship. A former Fortune 500 management consulting with IBM, he left the corporate world back in 2007 to forge his own path, starting with a management consulting firm and eventually co-founding Voltage Holdings. Today, Voltage isn't just any consultancy, it's an elite Amazon growth machine, helping brands launch, thrive, scale, and even exit or acquire their unique skin in the game approach. So first of all, Neil, welcome to the show. Thanks, John, for having me. I appreciate it. Absolutely. I'm really excited to dive into some topics today. We're going to talk specifically about Amazon and really how to grow your business on Amazon. One of the ways you guys do it is you've got some interesting techniques or strategies that have really helped businesses to grow organically on Amazon. Now, yeah. paid advertising, I'm sure you do as well, right? But we want to talk a little bit about the organic side. Yeah. Um, paid can be expensive. It can work well. It can really scale up an agency, but really in many ways, the organic side is more difficult, but it can be much more profitable. Can you talk a little bit about what are the strategies that you have found in the past that have worked really well that might be helpful for our audience? Well, it gets down to, and thank you for the question, it gets down to defining you know, a, a demand capture that is already on Amazon for a specific product type, shape, price point for users who've already had that audience conversation in their head through social media, friends, family, or some other mechanism, and they end up on Amazon to basically fulfill that demand. Uh, so the goal here is that is not to put yourself in the what we call the psychology of a buyer on Amazon, not to put yourself in the uh, idea that you're trying to convince someone to buy your product, but that you are capturing the demand that's already in their mind, answering the questions and providing the solution as quickly as possible. As Amazon says, you know, all things to all people in 30 seconds or less. So we've gotten really good at uh, reading the market and defining the market and capturing what it actually wants. Uh, through kind of a, just a series of testing processes. I think enough people um, have heard the idea that you grab a product and you sell a product and, you know, that's we're making a product and delivering a private label product. Number one, we're not flipping any products for profit, but we have in the past started that way, which kind of get got us on the journey of the private label side and realizing that controlling the asset, the IP, uh, and building the business with the end in mind, the exit was really what we were down to do. So to do that, we had to define the capture of a, a market, a segment that was in demand and simply get in front of it. Um, with 8,600 units a minute flying by Amazon, uh, there's a lot of demand that you can capture. I think what happens is people um, believe they need to convince someone to buy something like forceful sales, as opposed to getting in front of them and influencing the decision in their mind. We have just gotten really good at reading the data and not marrying the products. Um, the products will prove the data is good and that we have gotten in alignment with that customer expectation. And then the product will obviously become what it's going to become as long as it's a good product. We won't sell Me Too products past the test phase. We'll actually implement uh, controls and do a little R&D and innovation on the products, not inventions, but innovation against the products to actually match up more closely with what the market is. Now, here's what people, I think, John, get caught up with in the physical product world is they think everything has to be about the product at the start. So they go through all this big R&D time frame and let's do the analysis and focus groups and let's spend years and months and millions of dollars trying to develop this market. And that's certainly a way to do it. We have done that in the past and had limited successful results after all of that. Uh, when in actuality, if we simply test the market and ask it what it wants, it will tell us what it wants. If we're willing to listen, the market is smarter than we are. So if we are smart enough to follow the market, the products will identify themselves. As the saying goes, the cream of the crop will rise to the top. So if we ask the market enough variations, types, shapes, and product types, we will basically have those rise up. And then we will do a system of uh, launches behind it to go in and innovate and launch uh, what is already a proven 
uh, process um, of, you know, sales fixes everything, uh, which is the product actually sells. And then we go in and tweak the market to define it and grab the organic traffic that is already there in the system. And this happens across the Internet as well, not just Amazon. Amazon is just a really focused place for it. Um, but in the end, the buyer intent is very dramatically different on, say, Amazon than it is other locations. And we simply get in front of them with that right product just in time. And they want it from us. So they get it and they want more of it. And they tell their friends and family they want more of it. And we sell them more of the same thing in different packaging. That's a great way to summarize it. I, you talked a little bit about private label versus kind of coming up with your own invention. Is there one that's better than the other when when we're thinking about the exit or selling off a business in the future? Does one work better than the other? Or? Well, you can invent in the process, which we do. And if we can invent changes out of innovation, which is simply something in the market that's in demand, we make a slight variation, the innovation of that product. And the market says, yeah, I like that. In, in simple terms, someone's provided, you know, lemonade. And we say, well, what about lemonade in a cookie? Or what about lemonade in a pound cake? What about lemonade in a cupcake? And they're like, hey, we want the cupcakes and the lemonade. And bam, they start buying tons of the lemonade with cupcakes because that's what the market ultimately wanted. We can then innovate that into almost an invention state, giving us the opportunity to go after, say, a utility design patent, a notice of allowance, um, and maybe even go after the full patent itself if it's required or would be beneficial uh, for the intellectual property of the business in the long run, which means we can get to an invention state when we prove the product has that opportunity. Every product can have some innovation that turns into an invention. It's just whether or not you need to do it. And if it makes sense in the marketplace to defend or grab market share uh, in that way. And that is just a matter of going through the process itself. If you set out and try to invent something, that's not what most people can do. We're not Elon Musk, right? Um, not most of us are not, but we can look at ways to innovate and change things and make them better. And that's a much easier process for most people to follow. Yeah. And we've seen that a lot too. So my listeners know a lot about our agency. Of course, we've been around doing product launches for a long time. Uh, we'll often start outside of Amazon and, and then come back to there. And one of the reasons is a lot of the products that we do work with are true inventions, like things that are really new, different, or at least they certainly feel that way to the consumers, That's which great. is harder on Amazon. It right? So it's the beauty of what you're talking about is, is when you've got a product that you use now, we know the category the type of product is proven on Amazon, it's it eliminates a lot of the risk, right? So you know what you're getting into yeah. and then simply, I call it simply, right? There's a lot of work that goes into it, but simply make it better, right? Look well, for find a product, that... make a product and sell the product. That is the culmination of the conversation at the end of the day. There's nuances, of course, but when the product is in demand, the people will want it from you, they will take it from you organically. And if you get in front of that traffic, which we just talked about a second ago, Amazon's like a river, but it's a big decision tree of data in essence. And the data is very smart. It's been there for a long time. It's just getting more intelligence with, you know, a long, uh, large language models, a coming uh, system called Cosmo that they've implemented that is going to change the way people uh, get data. If you think minority report and ever watched, you know, advertising that's following you around the interwebs and around buildings, that's what's coming. Uh, is advertising that basically becomes pinpointed to you, your preferences, your social intent, whether or not they can determine that you are male or female or whatever, or you are pregnant or not pregnant. If you have kids or don't, it's going to be written in the history of your life and they're going to be able to give you direct response marketing. So what we are is direct response marketers on Amazon. We're not actually product sellers. Amazon is a product seller in this instance on that platform. We are simply direct response marketers answering the question in the minds of the customers and providing them with a solution to that. And that demand is already there moving like a seven lane highway. The other aspect of it is demand creation, which is where the social media, web, social commerce, paid traffic and other things are driving that conversation in informing the customer, talking about the differences in the product, and then obviously getting them to con you know, convert through other channels, not just Amazon, could be Shopify, TikTok shops, Walmart.com, it really doesn't matter, be Etsy. It really matters that wherever that buyer is, you have something that they want and you've got in front of that type of audience. I just find that for new people and you know the opportunity for growth, because we can run to eight figures in four years when you capture the right demand, the right product and the right brand, um, you can run to eight figures in four years on Amazon. And that's what I love about the marketplace is I can prove and incubate a brand within the you know framework that we've created our systems and softwares tools and methodology that gives people the opportunity to get in front of that traffic and fix those sales problems what happens so much on the paid traffic media side um this constant battles with the account and keeping it online and did your cpms run over and are you getting your first acquisition sale or second acquisition have you got your sms and follow-up sequences in place are you getting that customer to come back to you are you reaching them in direct mail and response so much of that engine is taken care of already on amazon 
So we just need to focus on what the customer wants. And that's a big factor in the success of any business. And so we focus there first and we let the systems of trillions of dollars of infrastructure ride that kind of done for you back end for us. And that gets us an opportunity to, to tackle it later, which we will go omni-channel or multi-channel beyond Amazon. But first, I just wanted to find if I can sell the dang thing. And I wanted to find it as fast as I can. And, you know, we have a lot of listeners that may have a successful business that is yeah. maybe doing something on Amazon, but most of it's outside of Amazon, let's say. Sure. So the, the importance, we always talk about the importance of Amazon, even if it's not your primary channel, you've got to be there for consumer products. Because if you're not, then you've got a heavy Amazon shopper that might see your ad on Facebook or TikTok or whatever, and they look for it on Amazon. If they can't find it, even if you're there, but you're far down in the organic listings, yeah. then you can't be found easily. Then they're going to buy a competitor, even if it's not as good, right? It might Correct. be cheaper, faster, easier to get to, whatever. Do you have any advice for, so whether I guess it's a brand new product you're launching that you found on Amazon and made better, or if you've got an existing business, what are some of the strategies or, or, or techniques to really keep in mind to build up or improve your organic presence to make sure your listing shows up when people search for it? There's something we call the halo effect, um, which you may have heard, which is basically an omni-channel effect from one platform to another, depending upon where the buyer wants to actually make the transaction occur. So if they're on TikTok shops and they don't feel comfortable ordering through TikTok, they're typically going to jump to Amazon. Amazon knows that so well in the data that they literally just align with TikTok shops to allow Amazon purchases inside of TikTok shops. So they're smart enough to have figured out that they're about 30 to 40 percent. And this is what we've seen in our accounts of TikTok shop. Uh, you know, interest in the demand creation side will fall back to the Amazon account. If you're able to be found on Amazon, you're going to gain that benefit. It's found money, especially if you have a forward marketing DTC strategy under your belt, which is what you mentioned a minute ago. Amazon literally already has that demand, most likely already has those products and your competitors are finding those products. We had a guy come through the other day and literally he had most of his inventory blow out on Amazon in about 36 hours and he couldn't figure out what the heck was happening because it hadn't happened before. What occurred was a competitor's video went viral on TikTok shops. When they came across to find that product, they discovered his because he was doing a better job on Amazon's search engine organically ranking, uh, ranking for his product and they bought his instead. So it wasn't even his video that created the demand, but he got the benefit of capturing it on Amazon. So really it's a you know a capture platform for the halo effect that occurs across the interweb, you know, interwebs from media and social and in meta and YouTube and everywhere else. They are falling back. Even 30% of television ads and commercials now end up on Amazon, even if they don't say go to Amazon. And I discovered this about 10 years ago when I was up with my three-year-old, uh, one of my four daughters, um, who was three and she was being fed at about four in the morning and I'm clicking through infomercials and up pops this uh, kid's product um, called Seat Pets. And it's about this pet you put in and you put the seat belt through and it holds their head. And I'm like, I'm thinking I'm gonna order one as I'm holding my kid. And I realized, hey, I could probably sell one of those. And I realized they were infomercials, had some experience and all that, and they're paying a lot of money to get an infomercial out there. I went over to Amazon and they had a really bad presence. So I said, hey, there's gotta be a product opportunity. We innovated a slight variation of that product. We launched ours and in eight weeks, we sold 2000 units organically with no marketing. We basically captured all that demand that was flowing on Amazon and we simply got ahead of it and we're charging more money for the products. And it taught us a really interesting lesson of, you know, 10 years ago about creating this demand and getting the organic results. So if I go in to compete with somebody and I find I have a very strong DTC presence uh, in the world of social media, online, pay traffic, et cetera, and I'll you know, look at their ads and stuff so they start retargeting me and I can kind of see where they're going. But I go back to Amazon and I find competitors, but I don't find them. I can literally step in front of their traffic, create a brand and capture all of their DTC traffic and brand that's coming onto Amazon and now become a competitor of theirs by basically siphoning off their organic traffic. So if you're not a DTC brand that has an Amazon presence, this is what's happening. You should be aware of that. You're losing up to 30%. If you're spending 50 to 100K a month on you know, paid media ads, you're going to lose anywhere between 18 to 30% of your traffic to competitors on Amazon who are taking that free traffic, thank you very much, uh, and getting it organically because it's already there and it's already flowing like a river. They just don't find you and we can position our products ahead of you and take that marketplace and then in reverse, go back into the demand creation mode of TikTok shops and other places and push it back the other direction, right? So what happens if it's done incorrectly? Because it's not the simplest platform to run on anymore. It was, you know, 10, 12 years ago when we started, but now it's gotten more complex, more competitive, more rules, more challenges in the place, especially on the organic side is to always test organically first as long as we can and validate that we've gotten in front of the right audience and that the system, this big AI system, is actually rewarding us with more impressions and clicks and hopefully sales. As we see that occurring over seven and 21 days inside of Amazon, then we'll start our media ads. 
Okay, if we do not see that in the first 721 days of our product launch organically, we will then optimize and make tweaks until we do see it from the organic system, and then we will apply PPC. Okay, we've learned a while back with Amazon changing up its marketing engine that if you start paying for traffic uh, within 24 hours after the listing goes live, in our personal experience, it will negatively impact the organic results of that later on. Okay, you will have burned the engine of opportunity for organic and PPC will now be required for keeping that product alive in the system. Okay, you do it the right way. And there's a podcast you can go listen to that was just released from David LeBlanc, one of our clients. And you can check it out on the High Voltage Business Builders podcast, uh, was talking about his half a million a month in sales that he's now accomplished in 18 months with 90% of that being organic traffic. Okay. And that's really powerful because you get full price sales, all right? Organic traffic is full price sales. Does he pay for PPC? Actually, he does, but it's not a majority of the operational controls. He can actually do a whole lot more. And we were talking about that in real time, how he could actually gain more traction and make that probably a million dollar a month business by increasing his PPC because he has so much organic traffic. So even if his organic traffic dropped to 60%, because he took you know, a hypothetical 30% more uh, in paid traffic to acquire those customers. That's still a pretty good deal for him. Uh, and that's still a very profitable thing. So with the DTC side, just to summarize very simply, if you're not on Amazon, let's think about this in back in the history in the Wayback Machine. Once upon a time, there was Yellow Books and then it became a businesses online. And if you didn't have a brochure website, you weren't a legitimate company. In 2024 and beyond, I would, I would say as far back as 2020, if you do not have an Amazon presence combined with your Omni channel, you're no different than a business that didn't have a brochureware website. And people in the e-com world are not going to think you're legitimate. If they can't find you on that platform in combination with anything they've seen in the direct marketing world, they're going to question. But Neil, I have a $30 million DTC brand. You can't say that. Well, actually, I can because I've worked with many of those brands who've been able to do nothing on Amazon because they couldn't capture the demand correctly on Amazon. One of them came in and for 12 months, they had $16,000 in total revenue on Amazon, but a $30 million DTC business, okay? So there is, it's an economic engine that most people don't understand how to take advantage of, and they wanna push it harder or faster like paid media ads can do, and they don't respect the organic engine that's working underneath in their benefit that will you know, snowflake and snowball into an avalanche if you do it the right way. Fast forward, 12 months later, we had them over 100K a month. That's awesome. And I think it's, that's great advice because it's the opposite is often what we hear. Yeah. Get into paid first and quickly to get some learnings. And, you know, you can get faster traffic, but like you said, you get, you can get penalized. Well, by sure. Amazon and certain and platforms. Also. Absolutely. When we know that happens yeah. on Meta too. I mean, Meta makes you yep. pay for reach now. Okay. So this is not a new thing. We just, most people aren't recognizing it's occurring on Amazon. And if yeah. you forcibly put that PPC traffic on Amazon's going to, Amazon's going to make you pay for it. So don't yeah, do it. They get, get your organic They get addicted first. to it, right? Yeah, they know you're score. willing to pay. So there's a yeah. score they track, and you start out at 100. When the listing goes live on Amazon, and you get that 100 core it is score, you're as yours to lose. Okay, the longer it is ranking and impressions and clicks and sales on organic, the higher that score stays over a longer period of time. When it's when it's um, you know validated in this big engine of you know sales and economic merchant machine it's, it gets to the five and four star reviews on your product and you're closing the big loop of this engine's positivity and putting a history of good data behind you in comparison to competitors that are already in the market so i don't care if they have five or ten thousand reviews in five to ten reviews with a great organic front a great image and high converting listing which means i'm talking directly to my audience as best as i can then I'm going to outpace those products later on. And I can go to three, four, five thousand dollars a day in sales on Amazon with product launches that have five to ten organic reviews on them. Okay. Because the engine is dialed in. It wants to show what we have to people. It wants to get the best thing in front of its customers as fast as possible. And then my burden as a business owner is to capitalize on that, like a wave coming into the ocean. Okay. Once that wave takes off, I have to create more inventory and I have to level up my inventory on Amazon for that algorithm to actually propagate me faster and faster. So if you're not able to capitalize inventory on Amazon pay, past, say, $5,000, you are going to miss this out, right? So by the time you get to 10, 20, $50,000 in inventory, thousands of units leveling up in the systems checked into Amazon's algorithm, you're not going to beat the other competitors because you just put a few thousand units in. It's not how it works. The algorithm is literally going to hold you back. People do not understand this about how it works. It will not let you stock out unless you forcibly let it stock out. So it's going to hold back and throttle you against other competitors who are meeting existing customer demand in that you know, river that's running who have 10 or 20,000 units checked into Amazon. It's going to give them 
what the customers want, the inventory that's available. You are not going to compete with them until you level up your inventory. That's great advice. I want to change topics for a second. Sure so I know over the years, you've had a lot of success in helping many of your clients exit Amazon, sell off their businesses, right? So that's a goal of a lot of our listeners as well as build up their e-commerce business to a brand or a business that they can sell off. Any advice that you have? I know you talk a lot about making sure you prepare for the exit in yeah. the early stages of a business as opposed to later on Correct. and it'll increase your value. Can you talk a bit more about that? So what we call building the, you know, from the beginning with the end in mind is actually structuring a business away from yourself, okay, and into a brand that keeps your personal liabilities off the table in your business as the primary runner of the brand. That could be the way you structure your LLC formation and the way you put IP and in Amazon's world brand registration or in the world of marketing and online trademarks, okay? Uh, to create that IP that in the end is going to be worth something in this business. As you put and propagate more products into it, our goal is to get to a million in EBITDA before the business becomes a saleable asset. Okay, We'll also acquire one and a half to $3 million in EBITDA, which we're working on five businesses to acquire right now um, that are between anywhere, you know, 10 to 30 million, but their EBITDA has to be between one and a half to 3 million and plus um, for the kind of businesses we're looking to acquire. So as someone who is acquiring, I'm going to try to speak for a minute to that spe you know, specificity for somebody who has a business that is wondering, could I sell it and what would it be worth? Three to five years minimum history in the business is what we're shooting for. Okay. Between years one and two is your building years. Between three and five is your growth to scale years. Okay. That's realistic expectations for an e-commerce business. I know everybody wants to hit seven figures in year one. It's not always realistic to do it. It's not always realistic to do it with full profit if you're going to reinvest everything back into the engine. So year two and three becomes real growth. You do that correctly. And by year four, you could have scale. If you follow what Daniel Espy did, he replowed everything back into his business in year one, two, and three. And now year four, he's at eight and a half million this year and will we'll be around 16 million by the end of his year, fourth year going into his fifth year. Let me correct that. So fourth year going into his fifth year is 16 million. Okay. So the opportunity for you to put that forward is to understand where is the saleability of the business? What is this asset actually worth? In four to five years, an Amazon only channel is going to run around 2.5 to 2.7. If your net income or EBITDA is or seller discretionary earnings, depending upon how you structure the deal, and this may be language that people don't understand, <laughs> sorry, going through it kind of fast, but the profit you have in the business uh, at the bottom line, if you are doing more than a million, you should be around 2.5, 2.7 on Amazon if that's around 20% net, okay, 20% EBITDA. So if you're keeping 18 to 30%, that would obviously go up if you have multiple channels. If you're not just an Amazon only, you know, or FBA only private label. If you've got a DTC a shop like a Shopify that's bringing in, you know, 5% of revenue, it doesn't have to be a ton, but it has to be open and generating sales and customer acquisitions. If you've got TikTok shop doing the same, if you've got a Walmart platform or maybe even Etsy or Wayfair, depending upon what kind of product base and brand you're selling. Okay, for which marketplace, the more channels you have open generating revenue, the more the multiples go. If you have subscribe and save sellers on Amazon, you have a good base of those 500, 1000 or more turning over every month, every three months, every six months, every year in subscriptions of subscribe and save that's going to increase the valuation. If you're able to create that same subscription in one of the other channels, say Shopify with subscription bases, and you now have a building subscription model on there, you can see uh, multiples as high as SaaS companies between five to 15, uh, X on the multiples. So if you're building up single channels, I would encourage you to multiple your channels, even if they are not generating a good portion, let's say 80% is all Amazon and 20% is some other, uh, share of marketplaces that you've opened and are gathering and acquiring information. That is at least four to five X multiples. Uh, in the business, as long as your profitability matches up. So the goal there is to understand the timeline in which this is realistic, three to five years, the profitability that's realistic, you need to be between 18 to 30% net profit to really gain a high multiple uh, and to have a brand based product that is um, basically has multiple SKUs of selling in it, not a single SKU of seven figures. So as a builder and a buyer, we will not buy companies that are a seven figure plus company on one product, right? It must have multiple products and variations. It must have uh, a whole plethora, if you will, <laughs> to borrow a phrase, uh, of products that build up the brand and, and a number of them that are selling at good volume in, in the inside of the brand so that one product does not create a liability in the business. Um, hopefully that's answering your question on the specificity of some of that and, and why we're Absolutely. building in certain time frames yep. to that exit. No, very helpful. I think that's really helpful for our audience. So Neil, if our audience has questions for you or wants to sure. learn more from your business to interact, how do they get a hold of you? 
Yeah, simplest way, voltagedm.com. That's voltage digital marketing or dm.com. A free presentation, and I got software uh, opportunities for our green light tracker. Um, we've got a presentation and other information I give out. My High Voltage Business Builders podcast is on there where you can listen to episodes. We're now a top 5% globally ranked uh, podcast where we talk about business and growth and e-com and you know, alternatives and wealth uh, building as well as wealth keeping uh, in the business of e-commerce. Um, creating generational wealth exits is our goal. Um, and buying the companies is also the goal of Voltage as well. So as we build and we grow and we scale, we are also after that exit and any clients that we agree uh, fit into that mantra and want to go with, you know, go at it with us are ones we're going to look to exit and hopefully acquire as part of that process, which is why I do that at all. Well, this has been really helpful for me, I'm sure for many of our listeners as well. I, I do want to encourage everyone, please go visit their website. It's in our show notes also, but Voltage DM, as in digital marketing, voltagedm.com. A lot of resources on the site. You can learn a lot so that we can only talk about so much in a in this today's interview, but there's so much that Neil has shared in terms of various forms of education, his book as well. So go check out, learn more on their website. If you have questions or want to grow your own Amazon business, or if you're looking maybe to get into Amazon for the first time, great resources really to be able to help. I do want to say also, did you know you can meet with a member of my team absolutely free for a 30 minute strategy consultation? We've launched and grown hundreds of products since 2007 and learned some of our strategies while growing OxyClean back in the Billy Mays days. We're here to help. So please go to harvestgrowth.com and set up a call if you'd like to discuss further. 